We believe brain health is a human right. We believe it's a social and economic imperative. At ABI, we're democratizing global brain health by giving people access to the best minds and evidence-based information from around the world. Together, we are distilling complex science and turning it into actionable knowledge for everyone, everywhere. Will you join us? A continuing welcome, all of you, to Aspen Brain Institute's 2021 Expert Series. This week's guest, David Harry Stewart, is a special friend of Aspen Brain Institute and a very special friend of mine. David is the founder and the face of Aegist, a media company dedicated to championing the vitality, influence, and contributions of the modern 50 plus demographic. Aegist is also an agency that advises businesses, brands, and organizations on emerging trends and how to better understand, speak to, and engage this important and growing population segment. David's online publication is now supplemented by his weekly Super Age Live Better podcast in which he interviews experts, scientists, and thought leaders in the field of longevity. As an aside, he is a most generous host who truly brings out the best in all of his guests. What is particularly engaging about today's session is that we will also hear from David from another perspective, one that has evolved organically through his work with Aegist. David has become a masterful citizen scientist who carefully and critically selects from a seemingly infinite menu of potential tools and interventions to enhance his own health and lifespan. We look forward to speaking with him in his capacity in each of these several and evolving roles. David, welcome to Aspen Brain Institute's expert series. Thank you, Ronnie. I am truly humbled to be here considering on who else you have on this. Um, it's, it's a wonderful honor, thank you. Since we're beginning with humble <laughs> and evolution, let us begin at the beginning. David, where were you born? And what were some of the essential formative experiences that shaped you? I do recall, I must say, hearing something about a 90 year old mother who was quite a musician. <laughs> Indeed. So uh, way back, I was born outside of Cleveland, Ohio in 1958. Shortly thereafter, we moved to upstate New York. And I grew up in a little farm town in upstate New York called Geneseo. Uh, single mom, younger brother. And my mom is a, is a trained musician. And indeed, she is 90. And mom at 90 is an, has an impressive voice, um, one that I do not share. Um, so we grew up in this little town. And I was always like a bit much um, for the town and for the people that I was around. And I learned sort of early on, it was best to keep my thoughts to myself. Um, and so, you know, in, in high school, Ronnie, they thought I wasn't very smart um, because I didn't really want to speak or say anything. I didn't participate because anytime I opened my mouth, I, you know, um, people didn't like what I had to say. So um, what happened was I, I would always do, you know, pretty well on standardized tests. And uh, they said, well, maybe you should go to a two year technical college where you'll be OK and you'll you'll be able to handle it. <laughs> and I said, well, what's the hardest thing I can do? So I went to uh, I went to school for mechanical engineering. And it's it, to this day, I mean, to all the other people who do something like that, um, it's like joining the Marines. Um, it's still like the hardest thing I have ever done. Uh, you know, going to engineering school in 1976 was not for the faint of heart. Um, there was, uh, it was not a very PC experience, but it was great. It really taught me how to work and how to critically think. Did that for a while. Uh, I didn't, I, I felt I wanted a broader sense of education. I was always very curious about things, always reading. And so I, um, I, I got a degree there and then I went to Boston and I, 
got another degree from Boston University. And while I was there, because liberal arts school was so much easier than engineering school, I went to school at night studying photography and I got a job. Uh, and at the age of 22, I declared myself to be a photographer as only a 22 year old can do. <laughs> I, said, I, I declare it, therefore I am. <laughs> and I sort of manifested that. And, you know, I had my first ads in Vogue and I was like 24, I was living in Paris by the time I was 25 working for the magazines there and came back to New York and um, started working for interview and then all the Condé Nast and Hearst magazines and decided fashion wasn't quite the thing for me. I didn't really have the temperament for that. Uh, and I moved into more pictures of people, um, advertising. I've done maybe a dozen covers of the New York Times magazine, a lot of covers in New York magazine. Um, and then, you know, Nike, American Express, a lot of that stuff. It's very interesting. You are so humble. <laughs> I know that uh, somehow at, at some point in one of your discussions somewhere, you referenced a picture you took of Muhammad Ali. Who no, no uh, Mike Tyson. Uh, but another I, hero, a different kind of hero. I, <laughs> and I asked you about it. Uh, tell us the quick story. Uh, Tyson is brilliant. I heard him speak at the <laughs> New York Public Library. And the irony of that for someone who spoke about his experience of leaving school when he was about 11 and returning daily for spaghetti in the cafeteria. And now he was speaking at the New York Public Library. Mike is um, an extraordinary human being. Uh, one of the most unusual people I've ever photographed. And, and, you know, during my photography career, they never asked me to photograph normal people. It was always like, you know, being sent somewhere to photograph somebody extraordinary. And, and Mike, so the, so the story is I get sent, uh, I get the call actually. And um, I'm on set with David Blaine of all people taking his picture for another New York Times story. And the phone rings and they said, well, you want to go to Maui in two days and photograph Mike. Now, Mike had just eaten the ear of Evander Holyfield, released from prison. You know, there were some bad stories out there about Mike. And I'm thinking, whoa. And I, and I asked Blaine, who's there. And Blaine says, no, 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 Mike's a really good guy. Don't believe any of that stuff. And I thought, hmm, OK, I'll do it. So I go out there. And so what happens is. We like the first day, there's sort of a media thing that goes on and it's sort of this horseshoe thing. And uh, Mike's uh, PR people come and they say, OK, listen, how, this is how we're going to do this. We're just going to talk about boxing today. Um, Mike's got a boxing match coming up. So let's talk about that. And they have media, you know, mostly TV media from around the world. And like the third sort of like station is Fox Sports. And of course, they send a woman and she gets right up in Mike's face. First question, why do you hate women? And just goes at him with this, like, like inches away. And Mike's like, what, what, like, what, what what's going on? You're like, why, why are you talking about Mike's? And she won't stop, right? And Mike, after a few minutes of this, Mike snaps and he's gonna kill her. And um, Mike always travels with these two huge guys and they pick him up off the ground and take him out of the room, otherwise she would be dead. Um, but so Fox Sports got their, their quote of the night. They were very happy about that. I'm sure she was quite pleased. She should have been pleased that she was still alive because um, if Mike hit her, she wouldn't be. Uh, <laughs> so we go back to our room and we're thinking, oh, this is not good. <laughs> this is really not good. So we get a call like two days later, we're just, they just keep you waiting and he's got this secret training facility. And so we go up there. And Mike's got a ring set up inside of like sort of a semi-outdoor concert room. And there's somebody on the turntables there. And I watch Mike and Mike hits a guy who's, I don't know, six, 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 eight, maybe two, 280, maybe. Hits him with an uppercut in the, in the chest, lifts the guy off the ground and throws him across the room and the guy's unconscious. And just, I watched, I was like, oh my God. 
And you go into the waiting room and there are dozens of large bleeding men in states of semi-consciousness. And then the trainer comes out and he's like, oh, Mike is in such a bad mood. He threw up in the ring today. I've never seen him like this. And I'm thinking, oh my God, Mike, why, why, why? How am I going to get out of this? So eventually, me and my sister, they were all set up, we're ready to go. Mike comes out and Mike's not that big, right? Mike's like maybe 5'9", five, 5'10". Five, He's like 2'10 two, or 220 though. And this is like phalanx of guys behind him. And he comes out and I go out and I go, hi, Mike, I'm David Stewart, New York Times, you're doing a cover today. And he's like, oh, wow, New York Times Magazine. Cool, come on down to my condo. I'm thinking, okay, <laughs> what am I gonna do, say no? <laughs> so we go down there and we get set up. And so I got this big camera, I'm looking down through it. And Mike is like three, maybe three feet away from me. And Mike starts running this line of crap on me. How he's such a bad dude and he wants to eat babies and he hates them. He starts doing this whole thing with me. And I realize he's messing with me. It's like, here's another white honky journalist and he's going to mess with them. But I remember Blaine saying like, he's okay. So I'm thinking, I got to do something here to change this situation. So I reach out and I slap him. And I just, I say, Mike, quack, you ain't so bad. <laughs> now I think... At this moment, I may die. <laughs> and he just smiles at me. And he's like, oh, you're okay. <laughs> oh, and, I'm wondering, I'm mine. and um, one of the scariest things I've ever done, uh, it, but Mike is, um, Mike's a really complicated guy in that he wants you to think much worse of him than he really is. There are very few people I've met like that. People generally want to want you to think better of them than they are. Mike's the opposite. He's actually like a really cool, interesting, curious guy who wants you to think he's like something else. So yeah, that's my Mike story. Uh, serving as a uh, mosquito bite, <laughs> providing him a slap. <laughs> so, he's, he's an extraordinary man. And, <laughs> and yet I have to say um, the Aspen Brain Institute worries about his brain and hopes for him all good things in in the future. I, I'm reminded as you're speaking of, uh, uh, of, of Steve Jobs' cast of characters on the, 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 the we are the, the, the crazy ones. Um, if there had been room for Mike, uh, he, he, he would have been there. Oh my. Uh, so, how do we move on from that generating sense of suspense and excitement? The ageist, fast forward. Yeah. Yeah. How did that come about? Um, absolutely. So when I, I'm, I'm 62 now, when I was, I was 56, I was, became acutely aware that all of the messaging aimed at people my age, the visuals, the, uh, the stories, everything had to do with us being a problem in need of a solution. And I found this whole medicalization and was just infantilizing. And I thought, why is this? That wherever I look, it's pharma ads, it's AARP, it's, you know, be scared, be very scared. Uh, you know, there was just nothing aspirational out there. And I, I, I thought this is really weird. Like, I don't feel like that. I feel great. Um, my friends all feel great. We feel at the peak of our powers, and yet we're being spoken to as if we, we need a, like a bag of meds to walk out the door. And I, I thought, this is just not right. You know, let's investigate what this is about. And we did. So we wanted to understand, first of all, why this messaging was out there, why we were different from it, how we were different from our parents, and how we were different because not everybody our age was living this way. There were clearly people who were, you know, living in the way that was being described, but we weren't. So we, I don't know, several thousand hours of interviews. And um, one of the things I like to tell people about is part of the investigation involved Tinder. And so <laughs> what we did was we started, I needed to take, I'm a photographer, right? So it's like the main, one of the main things about people our age is what does it look like? like the aesthetics of it become really key. And every, all the visual, the whole visual vernacular was just broken. 
and we needed to reinvent it, but we weren't quite sure how, so we had to build a library. So I joined Tinder. And uh, what happens is if you're over, I think it's like 35. No, the, I think the upper limit, maybe it's 50, 40. I want to say it's 40. So they just kind of group everybody over 40 the same. And if you pay them like 35 bucks or something, you can move your geolocator around. So it took me maybe three months. And every time you saw me, I would be on my phone on Tinder, always swipe left, never swipe right. And I was screen shooting all these people. So I became... Like, if you ever want to know about Tinder profiles, I'm your guy. Like, I became the world's foremost expert on Tinder profiles of people over 50. And I accumulated this vast visual archive of what these people look like and their interests. Now, we know they're going to lie about all kinds of stuff, their age or their weight or whatever. But they don't lie about stuff like horseback riding or stuff. So you, you, it was a way to, like, collect a huge amount of data really quickly. Um, and to and to show people like, hey, this is what this really looks like. It's not, you know, as much as we like Betty White, it's not Betty White. It's not AARP. It's it's a very different thing. And then we started publishing a newsletter. Our grand ambition was that, and we sent to fifty of our friends, was that our fifty friends would remain our friends after we sent them this thing, and they did. And now it's grown, and it's we have this global thing, but that's how it started. It was very humble. David, I have to say your story about why you joined Tinder is everybody's story about why <laughs> you joined Tinder. That's okay. We understand. We're glad it all worked out. Um, and My amazing. wife was amused, by the way. She just thought the whole thing was hysterical. <laughs> they always are amused, or they say they are. <laughs> So how how has ageist uh, uh, evolved, and how how do you view it as continuing to evolve to the extent that you can imagine or predict or aspire? Yeah, so you know we started with this idea of the profile because what we felt was missing was an example of someone from our group, how they were living, what they look like, and people could learn from that. Because my, my feeling is that, you know, the government regulates, people are all like, do you fight ageism? It's like, no, absolutely not. I absolutely do not do that. Um, my feeling is what we do is we just present examples. And story is what moves culture. And culture is what moves things like regulations and governments and, you know, corporate behavior. But you kind of got to start in this, in this other place. And that's what we did. We said, okay, here's this interesting person. Sometimes we do, occasionally we do famous people. We tend to stay away from that because celebrity is like a different, it's just like a different planet. Um, so we, we do people who are more or less like us and we say, hey, they're living in this like, like really vital, vivid, forward leaning way. And if you want to, you can do this, but it's on the menu now. It's, it's like, now you have a choice. Now you know this exists. It's not an impossibility because you know as has been said, we can only do what we imagine is possible to do. And if you present an example and you say, this is this person, this is what they do. Now it's in your imagination. Now it's not an impossibility. So we, we always start with that. And then we evolved into this sort of 360 ecosystem around this kind of person. So, you know, what do they eat? Their uh, approaches to longevity, travel, culture, all these sort of things. And where that led me to was we do a lot of brand work. And a lot of this brand work has to do with people in the sort of science health span space. And there's a lot of people that want to work with us. And my feeling is if you want to work with us, you have to convince me that whatever it is that you're doing is correct. <laughs> there's some science here. We're not goop. And, you know, I'm not a dumb dumb. Um, you put me on the phone with your lead scientists and let me talk to them. Let me read what they're up to. And if you can convince me that you have a legit thing, I'm all in. Um, and then my job is I sort of interface the, the sort of science with um, sort of normal people. So I can understand, I can, I'm not a scientist, um, but I can understand enough of what they are telling me 
so that I can interpret it to other people and say, this is why this is important. And this is why we should pay attention to this. And so that has really led me into this cadre of just science people, a number of who've been on your, you know, at the Aspen Brain Institute, really the highest levels of health span longevity. And I've, I've been privileged to hear what they're working on and what they're doing. Well, we're gonna do the deep dive into longevity in a, in a, in a few moments. I, I wanna, uh, for, for, a, for a bit though, hear your assessment uh, from a societal or cultural perspective. What do you think has changed since you founded AGES, mm. both yeah. externally in terms yeah. of the environment and even internally? Um, with respect to yourself? Yeah, that's a really excellent question, Ronnie. So um, I can tell you that the business model of the Aegis has never been really audience-based. It's always been knowledge-based. Um, we take our knowledge and we work with brands and companies on that. Uh, in the beginning, we would, we would solicit business and people would run for us. Like we were the thing they didn't want to catch. Like, we were, there was just, nobody would return our calls. They would just run away. Ah! And now we don't do any outreach. Um, it's all we can do to handle all the incoming. Uh, it's, a, it's a very different environment. And I think that we're in a time of culture where things that seem immovable move very rapidly. And, you know, if we look at sort of a timeline the way, say, women's rights. So that started mid 1850s. And then, you know, there's the right to vote. It's like 50, 60 years later. And then equal pay was like the 1960s. And we're still sort of grappling with that. So that was a very slow arc. But if you look at something like, um, you know, gay rights was faster. The, the issues around transgender was just like, boom. It was just, you know, like a matter of, of two or three years. And I think that there's something about the culture now, it's very malleable and things can move quickly. And I'm seeing this move very quickly. And I, I think a lot of this has to do with people are understanding that they have a pretty good chance of living a long time. They're starting to see more examples of people like me and what we do in Aegist as this is kind of cool. So um, we want to be part of this. I, I think the culture still has a long way to go because it, it's a, the idea of age, it's, it's tied up with mortality. Um, it's tied up with a lot of other issues that, that are really hard for people to get their mind around that, you know, for instance, I'm never going to wake up tomorrow and be a black woman, never going to happen. Um, but I'm 62. I've been 58. I've been 50. I've been 30. I've been 20. These are all part of my identity. And so when we look in the mirror and we've done studies on this, the delta between how the age people are and the average delta they feel is about 20 years. So that gets really very confusing. Um, and I think that that's one of the things that's tied up with how Ageism is definitely, it's also sort of tied up with how you think about your parents, um, these other role models you've seen in your life. It's complicated. The, I mean, for me, what I've learned is that I've had the privilege of, you know, we've interviewed a lot of people and it's sort of, I don't know, Ronnie, it's kind of like having the perfect parent. Like you talk to enough people and you get sort of all this wisdom and you, you know, what I realized is that the, you know, first of all, I think I'm going to live for a really long time. That's part of a later discussion. Um, but I've sort of learned how to do that. I've learned sort of the best practices from people. And it's, I've also learned that there isn't really, I mean, there is sort of a slowing down and end at some point way up in the age column. But you know, as somebody said to me, um, you can learn anything in three years. Like, you know, if Ronnie, if you decided tomorrow you wanted to learn Mandarin, in three years you could learn, you could be speaking Mandarin. You're never going to be at the UN translating, but you can learn it pretty well. And I think 
this idea of the ability to learn neuroplasticity that we're not done. This is one of the ideas that's just really baked into the culture that after a certain age, you have an incapacity um, to take in new things. And it's true, as we age, our brains function differently than we did when we were 20. They're not, it's not better or worse, it's just different. Um, and so that's been really kind of wonderful. Well, as, as, we, as we know, uh neuroplasticity for kids and approximately um, uh, to the, for um, um, young adults to the age of about uh, 25, our brains are literally neuroplasticity machines. But it's precisely as you say, David, uh, neuroplasticity is available to us for our lifetime. The elegant uh, neuroscience today is teaching us, however, the special tools and tricks and uh, the processes, if you will, of accessing that neuroplasticity, it's not the same as when you're 13 years old and, uh, and learning to skateboard uh, for the first time um, and get it, get it right away. But it is possible. And that uh, would actually be the, the, the subject of a wonderful uh, conversation. In fact, you and I have spoken about um, my, returning uh, to, to, to your show and talking about precisely that, because there are, you know, we, we all know the things we need to do to take care of ourselves. Uh, the, the list is long, but how to do those things, um, how to access that neuroplasticity there are some mechanisms involved and uh, they are crazy and they are exciting. And yes, they're available to us for a lifetime. And when we next speak, I'll give you, I never did tell you the story about my taking Mandarin. For, oh. for, 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 but I only for a year, you said I learned it in three. Um, in any case, I did tell you, however, and recently shared with you uh, a scientific article uh, with the title, quote, older subjective age is yeah. related to accelerated epigenetic aging. And this is something right. that was published on May the 6th. Right. And the brief summary, individuals who feel older than their chronologic age were in fact determined to be biologically older yep. on an epigenetic clock measurement. And, and to oversimplify this grossly, one could conclude that you are as old as you feel. And in fact, biologic age appears to change related to your subjective feelings about your age right. in negative manner. And what I particularly love about uh, that piece was the interplay of the subjective and the objective forces that were measurable and had impact. And it seems to me, David, that your work now is two-pronged. You focus both on the subjective experience perspective of aging, uh, profiling, as you described, individuals and sharing their truly inspiring stories, we need to talk about Joan, as well as the objective experience of aging, that is the science of aging, uh, reporting on how science affects the process. Now you have written about taking the index test by Elysium Health, which yeah, measures your test. biologic, the Morgan Levine test, yeah. your, a guest we shared. Uh, uh, at the Aspen Brain Institute and uh, on your uh, excellent podcast. And that was an especially uh, lovely one. Uh, and the index test measures one's biologic age and cumulative rate of aging. Could you tell us both about your 
subjective and objective experiences with that test? Yeah, I, so I think that they're, the one leads to the other. So it, if you feel younger, which means, and I take that to mean you, you feel as though you're gonna live a long time, you're an optimistic view about the future, you're gonna behave in an objective way to cause that to happen. So for instance, like if I think, um, I don't know, I'm just sort of tired with this whole thing. I'm on to play this out. It's the last long weekend. I feel kind of creaky. I'm gonna behave in a way that's gonna accelerate that and cause that to happen. If I'm feeling optimistic and I say to myself, oh, hmm, David, you're gonna be alive for another 50 years. You're gonna take care of this thing. You cause that to happen. So these, these are related. Uh, you know, my, uh, my actual chronological age is 62. My age on the index test, I believe was 56. And so I don't have a calculator handy, but I think I'm aging at like 0.82 or something like that. Uh, and, I hope, and I hope to improve that. So you uh, are planning a retest? Uh, I think so, yeah. I think, it's, um, I think that's one of the interesting things about these kinds of tests is that you can, you can say, okay, uh, here I was like at this year, um, let's do it again and see, can I bring that coefficient down? Uh, you know, what, what's that going to look like? Um, I, I think that's really interesting. Well, I was delighted to contribute an article to Aegis during COVID, uh, predicting that 2020 would be an epigenetic risk factor. Yep. And you have predicted that there will be a bounce back from that. Yep, absolutely. And, and, and the basis for that hypothesis? Well, um, it is twofold. Um, I, I think on the one hand, if you look at sort of mortality rates over the last couple of hundred years, they're, they, you know, they sort of go in this straight line in there, but there's like points up and you know, above and below. Um, I, I think that we'll probably bounce back from this epigenetically. I do agree that there's, there will be, there will be epigenetic, how should I say? Um, mortality and disease effects from the last year. Um, I, I have no doubt about that, that there will, we will see at some point in the future, a bump up in some kind of uh, disease effects because of the kind of stress that people have been under for the last year. But I also think that will, you know, we recover. Some people will recover better than others. Um, to the, to the extent that you know, we're able to clear up some of this epigenetic stress, some of this, this damage that's there. I, I think that this, this last thing that happened this last year was, a, was global. So that's a, that's a big deal. Um, I don't know, you know, in the studies that we've done with the people at our age, interestingly enough, they didn't feel many stress effects. Uh, I, I think for people that are maybe younger teenagers or they're in college, I mean, they're missing out. They, they like missed out on this sort of crucial year and, it, it, you know, they're feeling all the stress from their parents and, you know, they might, they might get sick and I die. This is a lot of stuff there. So I'm, I tend to be overall an optimistic person, uh, but I do think there will be there, there will be a measurable epigenetic response. It, it, well, there's been a response. There'll be an effect further in the future. Well, there's, there's no, uh, just one statistic comes, comes to mind. And that was uh, from a, a study that was uh, done in conjunction with the Pew organization. And it was a, a pretty significant uh, population that, that was examined and the, Average, the average, David, weight gain oh, amongst yeah. thousands of people who did not want to gain weight. So there right. was a weight loss, but the average weight gain was 29 pounds. Yeah. And if we, what was not reported um, was any socioeconomic data right. about that group. 
And, um, and that's something we're also not discussing in terms of that, um, that, 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 that bump, if you will, uh, right. and the prediction of, uh, morbid, of uh, future morbidity and, and mortality. So uh, COVID was a flattener in the sense that uh, there were universally shared experiences and yet um, there, were, there are multiple worlds of difference, um, uh, not just in our population in the United States. I, you know, I think we have to be most respectful that at the same time uh, we're seeing this, these extraordinary uh, lights at the end of the tunnel that globally that is not the case and that vaccines are not available for countries that haven't even begun uh, to, to, to suffer from this disease. But again, for, 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 another, for another time. Um, it is interesting though, odd for us to be talking about um, longevity uh, aspirations on an individual basis in this, in this crazy world, but uh, that is our agenda for today. So I wanted to speak specifically about some of the interventions that uh, and tools that you are, let's use the word experimenting with. And of one. <laughs> and of one, yes, that's what we call it. And let's consider them epigenetic interventions. We're not changing your genes, but we right. are likely altering the expression of them. We uh, know, and most of, uh, much of our audience knows that the pillars of epigenetics are all the things we always knew were good for us, proper nutrition, sleep, physical activity, stress reduction, uh, social connectedness, et cetera. C can you share with us some of, uh, again, the specifics of what you personally are doing and what are the most challenging to maintain? Ooh, um, well, I, I do a lot of different things. I'm really big on tracking. Um, you know, since I have an N of one, I have a lot of data on my one. Uh, and so I, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I, I don't endorse this thing, I wear a whoop. Um, it's, I'm not quite sure how accurate it is, but it's reasonable. So, you know, I work, I can tell if I do an intervention, what the effect is on things like my resting heart rate, my heart rate variability, these things show up. Um, I track my weight every day, um, through something called weight gurus. And I have like a year and a half long graph of that. I, I've become really knowledgeable about macros. So carbohydrate, protein, fat, and, um, you know, I, I don't track them every day, but I have a pretty good idea. So, and I know like, I know how many calories I burn in a day and I got a pretty good idea of how many calories I eat and what the composition of that is. I think that, uh, I'm big on exercise. I'm specifically big on muscles. Um, because I think that your muscles will help you, you know, this idea of like, like visceral fat is a toxic organ. Okay. We just, we just get real. If we go back to that, like gain 20 pounds. And I, that study also said 10% of the population has gained 50 or more pounds. Like that's, that is, that is a chronic health. Like we're, that's not even epigenetics, man. That's just like, you're headed to all kinds of bad stuff with that. So I think that the idea of muscle building is something that people don't take seriously enough. Your muscles, uh, not only will you feel better about yourself because you're going to be strong, that feels good, which is going to cause you to behave in more optimistic ways. Uh, your muscles also act as this glucose sink. Um, we know that you know excess sugar in the bloodstream causes all kinds of bad things. So we want to avoid that. Um, I'm also on that topic, really big on low glycemic load food. So I'm really careful about what I eat to make sure that my blood sugar doesn't spike. I take supplements. Um, I try to take supplements that 
I know how they've been manufactured and I know that there's some efficacy there. Uh, I spoke to Dr. Rudy Tanzi uh, a couple of weeks ago and he gave me his brain health protocol, um, which is on my site. And there's a lot of the usual suspects in there, but what's, what was good was Rudy said, these are the things that work on my brain in the dish. And it, it, you know, they might not work on me because I have a digestive tract, which may cause some changes there. But as Rudy says, you're not gonna hurt yourself by doing this. So, so I do that. Um, I also, I think that having a strong cardiovascular system is important. I think that constant learning, my really my, one of my main protocols is there are two kinds of stress. There's the kind of sort of chronic stress that's really bad. There's all kinds of bad epigenetic outcomes from that. And we know about that. But there's also um, what I feel is sort of like um, pulsed stress. That's good stress. So pulsed stress is lifting weights. Pulse stress is running. Pulse stress is learning Mandarin. Pulse stress is going out and meeting new people. It's new stimulation. You're bringing new things into either your mind or your body that then your body has to adapt to um, to go forward. If we don't do this and we just stay in our sort of comfort zone and you know, basically total comfort leads to total decay. It, you, you need to be uncomfortable. <laughs> That's really the thing. Like, and this is one of the biggest things that I stress to people as you get older. When we were younger, when we were 20, being uncomfortable was fine. Like we were good with that. But as we get older, somehow we've been kind of trained into this idea to avoid discomfort. That's, um, that's not a good thing. Um, you know, we were human beings, we were built to work hard and we need to engage our bodies and our minds, um, our, our sense of knowledge, the way, and also socially. I think it's really important to challenge yourself socially. Like I, <clears throat> I lived in, you know, sort of very liberal blue enclaves my whole life. I live in Utah now. Um, it's a red state and it's awesome. <laughs> they, they think very differently than I do, but it works really well. And so it's like really interesting. Go, oh, like you can do this a different way and that works. Oh, that's really interesting. So I think exposing yourself to these sort of things and we almost need, as we get older to have a certain program and you know, like I know, like my, with my physicality, I know, like if it's Tuesday, this is what I'm going to do in the gym. Um, so that's, um, I, I think that's some of what I do. And of course the usual sleeping and, you know, drink water and the, the normal things. I, given that this is the Aspen Brain Institute, given that this is the Aspen Brain Institute expert series, you said <laughs> something very expert-like, David, that I really want to emphasize, and I don't think it can be emphasized enough, and that has to do with muscles. Yeah. Because we tend not to think about the brain and muscles, and in fact, to the extent <laughs> that there are stereotypes, no. like Tyson, we don't necessarily put the two of those together. The yeah. brain, as I know you know, is an extraordinary consumer of energy and accounts for 20% of our body's energy consumption. So, uh, you know, as you're moving your body, as you're trying some new thing, remember, your brain controls all this. <laughs> like, so if you're doing something new, you're helping your brain. You're not just helping your body. Well, speaking of helping, you once mentioned to me that you had a friend participate in um, what is known as the TRIM, T-R-I-I oh, yeah. study right. by uh, Greg, Fahey. Uh, Greg, Greg Fahey. And for uh, those in our audience who may not know about this, this is a study of, about uh, thymus regeneration to improve function of T cells responsible for immune infection, our ability to, uh, excuse me, immune function, our ability to fight infection. And it involved a, a cocktail of drugs, growth hormone, metformin and DHEA. Won't get into the details, in, in, uh, but essentially uh, this cocktail was taken for one year. Yes. This small group shed 
two and a half years yeah. of their biologic age as measured by multiple biologic clocks. Yes. Have you considered participating in his new study? He's advertising for, um, uh, for new subjects. I have considered it. Um, I may consider, I may be more considerate in, in, in round three. Uh, I'm, a, you know, there's, it is impressive. I mean, what they were trying to do was they, they said, okay, the reason most people die is because uh, their immune system doesn't work. So we're going to grow the thymus. Um, something like after the age of like 60 or 70, I believe your body just can't deal with a novel pathogen. So let's build up the thymus. And the thymus is apparently quite sensitive to human growth hormone. And they were taking um, small doses of it very carefully monitored, don't do this at home. Um, and people were very carefully screened because bad things can happen if you're doing that on your own. Uh, I thought that was fascinating. And some of the people from the first round are doing a second round because then they want to, what they want to see is, is it a multiplicative effect? Does the effect fall off? Does it stay this, you know, do you just get another two and a half or do you get five or do you just get six months? We don't know. Um, I think there's a lot of interesting things coming out of that. It's one of many things I see out in the world that, I, in my view, life expectancy, um, health span, I'll say that, health span is going to expand dramatically in the next 10 years. Well, tell me, so where and how do you personally draw the line on what you are willing to try today? Well, I'll, if... It's a, it's a cost benefit. Um, so what's the risk? So what's the possible downside versus what are the benefits? Uh, I think with Greg's work, seems pretty good. Um, 10 people, um, I'd like to see a little more of that. Uh, and I would like to, I, I need to little, know a little more before I do like a year of human growth hormone. Um, I'm not willing to go there. Uh, if if Rudy says something safe on his and his brain is a dish, I'm in. Um, yeah, absolutely. You know, when when people like when people like Rudy tell me something safe, um, yeah, give me more. Sounds wonderful. Um, but I I don't do things that I think are that have possible negative effects. You know, I'm fine with um, you know saunas. I think are are really interesting. Um, I've been doing, been investigating things to do with sound lately that, um, I'm finding that there's certain kind of designer sort of sound music that can lower my HRV and my overall stress level, which I think is fascinating. Um, but that's not going to hurt me. Um, so I'm going to sort of, you know, my, my model is let's keep the organ systems in really good shape for another 10 years. And if I can do that, I think I got a long runway after that. So you're really anticipating uh, my uh, closing question. Uh, what you're saying is that science for you is the essential tool for understanding and affecting healthy longevity. Yeah. And perhaps you could say just a, a little bit more about your process for vetting sciences oh yeah because there god knows um lots <laughs> of snake oil salesmen out there especially in the longevity space and i imagine david you must have many marketers yeah. knocking on your virtual door to uh, promote their products what what sets off the pseudoscience alarms for you? well even people who have a lot of letters after their name and they teach in famous places um, same deal. Um, I think the first thing to understand is that there's a Wall Street term. Um, they're talking their book. And whether that's a book or whether that's a, a study they want funded or a company that they're invested in or a brand or whatever, go into it with that idea. Um, and then see what the, see what the contrary information is. See what the, the real studies are. Uh, and I can't say I'm like great at discerning this, 
but uh and i'm and i'm open to you know you just send me whatever you send me like some magnet that glues on the top of my head okay um show me exactly how that works and why that works and um i'm i'm willing to look at it uh i i think that as you said there's there's a lot of contrary confusing information in this space because everybody nobody wants to die let's get real like it's you're you're selling you're selling into an into a built-in need. Um, we don't want to die. We don't want to get sick. That's a problem. So you come to me. You know, you come to anyone with a solution. Um, it it gets people's attention. But I I think that we have to look at these somewhat critically. Um, I also and, and but there's like two parts to this. The other part that I that bugs me is. I have a certain sort of bugbear with the New York Times. Uh, and you know what they're doing is the opposite. They're lowering the bar so much. And they say, you know, 30 minutes of mall walking will add five years to your life. Well, yeah, if you're like, you know, eating donuts in a Lazy Boy recliner, I guess so. But you got to do more than that. So in, in that case, what they're doing is they're just pandering to their audience. It takes a lot more than that. Like doing this stuff is hard. It takes effort. It takes direction. On the other hand, you have people saying like, take a shot of this two times a week and, you know, you're going to be Superman. Nah, okay. <laughs> Maybe. Let's investigate that a little bit. So, so funny. Um, I, um, I do love the New York Times. <laughs> Having said that, however, I fell today for a, uh, a headline on, in the science section. Uh, um, and uh, I, I'm not gonna get this exactly right, but basically it was that exercising in the evening was associated with positive outcomes or impact on metabolic health. And I thought, well, that's interesting. It's contrary to what I have understood and I, read pretty extensively on this, but okay, the New York Times is telling me it's so. So I opened the article and read the fine print. And the fine print was that the, yes, indeed, there was a significant study, but the population that was studied was eating, was obese and eating a very high fat diet. Yeah. yeah. So this was not a conclusion that was generalizable Right. To the wider audience. Right. And if all you read were the headline, uh, you'd be taking away some pretty significant. That mis I mean, you just it, this this ha is not just them. I don't mean to pick on them. This happens throughout the scientific literature. Like it's like, oh, we have this wonderful thing, and they pick like you know, ten obese people that live on lard. Uh, okay, <laughs> great. Like, what does it have to do with a normal person? Well, in the end, the, 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 the one thing we know that is part of the mystery and uh, the answer and the solution to the riddles of life, it's complicated. It's, it's complicated. super complicated. And it's when we said it's an N of one, we are each, we are living in a time of massive self-experimentation. Like I take a range of things, I do a range of things, I think they're good. Do they counteract? I don't know. Um, you know, metformin exercise and strength building. That was interesting. Counter effect. Who knew? Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of this out there, but to study it becomes like, there's just so many different factors overlaying. And we have these really complicated systems and it's really hard to figure it out. It, it will be figured out though. I think that this phase of N of one, what I call we're in now, we're moving out of. David, we both know we could talk together for <laughs> hours about the science of healthy aging. We have before and we will again, but uh, sadly for today, our time is mostly up and we know I've heard about your latest itinerary, uh, that it's time for you to pack lightly, I hope, for your trip, your upcoming trip 
to Greece, another epigenetic intervention, a very <laughs> important one. Yes. Uh, you, you today have again reminded us about our tremendous capacity to affect our own trajectory and our agency. And uh, you have reassured us that science is eminently embraceable, if not solvable, by those willing to expend reasonable effort. I want to share with you, it's kind of a blessing for your trip on air okay. or wherever you're with whomever you're flying. And this is an epigenetic prescription from my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Jordan Schlain. He uses it as part of his email signature. Live in rooms full of light, avoid <laughs> heavy food, be moderate in drinking of wine, take massage, baths, exercise, gymnastics, fight insomnia, with gentle rocking or the sound of running water, change surroundings, take long journeys, strictly avoid frightening ideas, indulge in cheerful conversation and amusements and listen to music as you recommended. Uh, this is a prescription from Cornelius Celsus, approximately over 2000 years ago. And the only thing missing from this 2000 year old list, spend a bunch of time with your dear friend, David Harry Stewart. <laughs> David, thank you for joining us today thank and you. sharing your uh, unique and compelling perspectives on the universal experience of aging. Thank you so much. It's just wonderful to chat with you always. Brian. And, and, and to be continued. And, and to our loyal global audience, we invite you to visit aspenbraininstitute.org for more information about David Harry Stewart, further references to his important and continuing work, as well as all ABI recordings, summaries, resources, and scheduled events. Thank you so much and see you soon.